know that it's genuine. And he does this by inflicting suffering on Job. Now, Job and his friends, they, they don't know about this scene in heaven. It's all a mystery to them. And so they've been questioning why all of this is happening. They've questioned Job's innocence. They've questioned God's justice. Well, Job has questioned God's justice. And there's been speech after speech after speech. And last week we saw the cycle of speeches ended when God spoke to Job and Job was left humbled and in awe. Well, today we reach the finish line. The last chapter, the final sermon, the end of the book of Job and the end of Job's suffering. And so let's get into it. In verse 7, God turns his attention to Job's three friends. And in this conversation, God vindicates Job. I'll just check how we're going with those slides. We... Ah, here we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, God vindicates Job. Now, what does that mean? Now, what, is, what, is it, what is vindication? Uh, what does it mean for somebody to be vindicated? Well, it's a, it's a legal word. It's a courtroom concept. Uh, have you ever watched the TV show Judge Judy? All right, Judge Judy. Yeah, I remember spending uh, many daytime afternoons when I should have been studying at uni watching Judge Judy. Well, <laughs> our family watched an episode of Judge Judy this week. And uh, there was in this episode a food delivery man uh, was suing his customer for 5000 US dollars. Now, here's what happened. Uh, he's at the door, he's delivering the food, when all of a sudden, um, the customer's dog charges at him and mauls his leg. And he's, uh, he's terrified, particularly about having rabies. And so, what does he do? Well, he calls 911. And uh, the emergency services arrive uh, and they treat his, his wound. And uh, thankfully for him, they reassure him that there's no chance that he has rabies. But he's so shaken by this vicious attack that he goes to hospital and gets tested. But here's the thing. This is the beast that so savagely attacked him. <laughs> right? And th look at the dress. This is a dog's wearing a dress. And here's the wound. Now, Judge Judy's job is to decide who is right and, and who is wrong. And in this case, she decides that the delivery man has overreacted, of course. We see the evidence, he's overreacted, and so the customer is not guilty, at least not guilty, of, of a $5,000 um, offence. And then when she's come to this uh, decision, she declares it publicly. She tells everybody, she tells the world, and this is vindication. Vindication is the public declaration of who is right. And so in these verses, God declares to Job's friends that Job is right and they're not. Have a look at verse 7. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So there's been a lot of talking in the book of Job, and Job's friends have said a lot of things. You know, you've probably got to, had a sense of that over these nine weeks. Uh, but they've defended God's justice. Uh, in their, in their uh, speeches, in their view, they say that God never does anything that is unjust. He never does anything wrong. Everything he does is about justice. And so if he has made Job suffer, well, it must be because Job has sinned. And so the just God is punishing him. And Job's also said a lot of things. Uh, he's cursed the day of his birth. He's cried out for death. He's declared his innocence. And because he's declared his innocence, he's questioned God's justice and he's challenged God. He's thrown down the gauntlet to God to answer for the way that he's treated him. Now, we saw last week that Job repented of the things he said. We saw last week that he, he took them back. He confessed that he wasn't right 
in what he had said about God. And so what does God mean in verse 7 when he says that Job has spoken the truth about him? How has Job spoken truth about God when Job said so many things that were wrong about God? Well, the answer is back, way back in chapter 9, verse 17. And I've got it on the screen for us. Where Job says uh, this about God. Uh, he, has, he batters me with a whirlwind and multiplies my wounds without cause. So this is the truth that Job has spoken about God. It's true that God has battered Job. It's true that, that God has wounded him over and over again. And Job said that God has done this without cause. That is, God has done this and Job doesn't deserve it. That God has done this, but Job doesn't deserve to be punished for sin. That Job hasn't sinned to deserve this. And so this is the truth that, that Job has spoken about God. You remember that scene in heaven? Chapters 1 and chapter 2, because God said all of this himself. Chapter 2, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. He still retains his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him without just cause. That God has say, said the same thing as what Job has said, without just cause. See, God declares that Job is right. That Job's not guilty. That yes, Job has suffered, but he hasn't sinned. But we can't say the same thing about Job's friends. Uh, in verse 7, God says, they have sinned. They have not spoken the truth about God. And now God is angry at them. And because God is angry at them, they themselves are under threat of punishment from God. What has happened to Job? That's what's, uh, that's what's possibly going to happen to these three friends. And ironically, they need Job to rescue them. Uh, have a look at verse 8. In verse 8, uh, God says to the, uh, the friends, Now take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer a burnt offering for yourselves. Then my servant Job will pray for you. I will surely accept his prayer and not deal with you as your folly deserves, for you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Now, did you notice uh, what God calls Job in those verses? It's repeated a few times in there uh, where God calls Job his servant. His servant. And God gives his servant a job to do. Uh, he, he, uh, he gives him the job to offer a sacrifice and to pray for his friends. And then uh, God says that when Job does this, I will hear his prayer. Now, what does that tell us? Well, it underlines for us the fact that Job is right. That according to God, Job is right. Despite all the talk from his friends, despite all the rumours, all the accusations, God is extremely clear to everyone. He says it publicly. Job is righteous. Job is with God. Job is God's friend. He's not guilty. Now, fast forward to the time of Jesus. Uh, at the time of Jesus, the religious leaders, they, they called Jesus a, a lawbreaker. Uh, that he violated God's commands, uh, a troublemaker, a blasphemer. They treated him like a criminal. They arrested him, they beat him, they put him before a judge. They paraded him publicly through the streets of Jerusalem. They made him carry a cross. The crowd insulted him. They stripped him naked in front of everyone. And they executed him right outside the city where everyone could see it. You know, that was their verdict on Jesus. But three days later, God spoke. He raised Jesus back to life, and this was God declaring his verdict on Jesus. 
Look at these words from the book of Acts where one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, is, uh, is talking to a crowd in Jerusalem and he says, therefore, that is because God has raised Jesus back to life, therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. See, when God raised Jesus uh, from the dead, he wasn't just doing a miracle. He wasn't just reversing the cross. He was making a declaration to the world, to everyone, public, out there. It's in the historical record that Jesus was not guilty. Jesus was not a blasphemer. He was not a sinner. God vindicated Jesus and declared him to be the Lord, the King of the universe, and declared him to be the Messiah, the Saviour, the one who can rescue people from their sins, just like Job did with his friends. Now, if you're not a Christian, I want to urge you to investigate what God says about Jesus. Now, we all have our opinions of Jesus, and you, you can read them on the internet, uh, but we've all got our opinions of Jesus. But what really matters is what God says about Jesus. Because according to God, Jesus is his servant. According to God, Jesus can intercede for you. According to God, Jesus can bring you forgiveness. And so I urge you to investigate what God says and weigh it up. But people have said all things about Jesus throughout history, and, and throughout history, people um, have said all sorts of things about his followers as well. In the past, they said that Christians were, uh, were good people. Sure, Christians are a little bit old-fashioned, uh, a little bit outdated, you know, stuck in the past, a bit boring, socks and sandals, that sort of thing, a uh, bit conservative. Uh, you know, Ned Flanders from The Simpsons, that's, that's the Christian. Um, but despite all of that, people would say that Christians were the good people, right? the moral people, the people you can trust. Not anymore. Things have changed, and it's happened very quickly. Have, have you noticed it? Have you seen it on social media? Have you seen it in the news, in conversations? The Christians are now seen less like Ned Flanders and more like Adolf Hitler. Oh, that's, that's an amazing thing, isn't it, to, to observe and to say. To some people, Christians are considered of the same type as Adolf Hitler. See, at the extreme, Christians are called bigots, phobic, toxic, dangerous. Some say that Christianity has no place, and I mean that no place in the modern world that we need to move on from Christianity and, and, and leave it in the past. We need to leave it behind because, um, because Christians are bad guys and what they believe and what they do are bad things. Now, do you find that frustrating? You know, when, you, when you read it, when you, when you hear it, uh, I do. Uh, it's frustrating because uh, I think one of the reasons I find it frustrating is because I, I know it's not true. Uh, I know it's not true of me. I'm not a bigot. I'm not a bad guy. I'm not, you know, causing harm or wanting to cause harm. Uh, and I know it's not true of you. Yes, we, we do think very differently to our culture. But we're not bad guys. And that's, I think that, that's frustrating. But listen to this promise. One day, Jesus will return. Every eye will see him shining brighter than the sun and everyone, everyone will recognise the truth about Jesus and the truth about us because on that day we will stand with Jesus and he will publicly declare to the whole world, to the whole universe, to the whole creation, these are my people. These are my servants. These are are my friends. So there is a day coming when we will be publicly vindicated. But let's go back to Job's story. 
God's vindicated Job. And now in verses 10 to 17, God restores Job. Uh, Verse 10. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his prosperity and doubled his previous possessions. God has, has taken Job's prosperity away and now he restores it. He gives it back double. Uh, it's important that we understand uh, why God does this and, why God, and why, God, why God doesn't do this. Or why, yes, the reason, why, the reason that he doesn't do it is not, he doesn't do it to reward Job. That's important to understand. It's not a reward. It's not because Job has been good or because Job worships him. It's not because Job deserves it. The whole book of Job, when we read it, is all about how God doesn't give good things to good people and suffering to those who sin. God doesn't work in that simplistic way. No, why does God restore Job? Well, it's kindness. It's mercy. It's grace. It's, that's the sort of God, God that God is. He's a good God who gives good things out of, out of kindness. And so he restores Job, and it's all spelled out in the, the next verses. Verse 11, uh, Job's family and friends arrive. Uh, previously, they deserted him. They'd left him alone. They'd shunned him. But now they come back, and they bring him sympathy and comfort. Verse 12, God uh, doubles Job's wealth. Uh, the number of his cattle uh, is doubled. If you flick back to chapter 1, you'll see the numbers there. And you see in chapter 42, the numbers are doubled. Verse 13, God gives Job a new family. Now, it would be simplistic to think that Job's family can just be replaced. Right? We, we know that's not true. The pain of, of loss can't be just, just swept away that easily. But God blesses Job with seven sons and three beautiful daughters. And then we read the end of Job's story in verse 16, uh, where Job lived 140 years after this, right? He, he lived another 140 years and he saw his children and their children to the fourth generation. And, cha- and verse 17, then Job died old and full of days. I think Job's life is a bit like our refrigerator at home. I, I, I get paid monthly. And that means that, um, that the, the, the week before payday, is a real stretch. And so before payday, I open the fridge and what do I see? We've got a, a, an old carrot. <laughs> this, is, this is true, right? Um, we've got a collection of sauces. We've always got lots of sauces. We've got a half, uh, half a jar of minced garlic and a scrap of cheese. That's our fridge. But how different is it after payday? Because after payday, the once empty fridge is full again. We've got meat, we've got fruit and vegetables, we've got yogurt and milk, and get this, we have a full block of cheese, right? (laughs) Job once had a full fridge. Chapter one, Job has got a full fridge, but then it became barren and empty. But now that God has restored Job, he's got a full fridge again, but more than that, his fridge is bursting. It's even fuller than before. So Job has been blessed by God abundantly. This is an amazing restoration, more than he could have ever imagined. See, Job's life has been given back to him, and it's better than what he had before. And it points us to an even greater event than this restoration of Job, because God restored Jesus to everlasting life. And God will do the same for us who trust in Jesus. When Jesus returns, we will be completely restored and whatever fullness we had in life now will seem like emptiness compared to what we have then. We will be bursting with life. So this chapter shows us that that we will be vindicated, we will be restored, but the truth is we're not there yet. It's in the future. And until then, We need to endure. The Bible never promises an easy life for us. It never promises that. Uh, Sometimes we can have this assumption, even if it's not a conscious thing, maybe it's just in the back of our minds, that if you're a Christian, then your life should be good. 
right? That the Christians are the ones who have the good lives, the lives that are all together. Uh, it's true, God does bless us here and now. Uh, you know, God gives us many blessings. And yes, living God's way generally should mean that we can avoid some things that will harm us and we, and we could generally have a better life than if we didn't live God's way. But the Bible never promises that because you're a Christian, you will have an easy life. In fact, the Bible tells us that, that our lives will be difficult. We will face suffering. We know this from our experience, uh, whether it's sickness, mental health problems, money troubles, grieving of uh, the loss of jobs, marriages, relationships. We cry over the deaths of loved ones. We face temptations from the world and the devil. And some of us here are suffering right now, today. And some of us here have been suffering for a long time. But then there are others of us here who, uh, who at the moment, life is really good for. Are having a great life, are feeling healthy, are feeling secure, all those things. But we will all face days of suffering sometime in our lives. And so when those days come, how can we endure? How can we keep going? How can we stick it out? What's well, by holding on to the promises of God? And one way we can do this is to engage in self-talk. You know, like when I was running. Uh, when I was running, I, I was telling myself these things. Um, self-talk, it's yeah, we, we think of motivational talks and self-talk and we think of those cheesy posters, you know, with the cats, you know, hanging in there uh, and that sort of thing. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not talking about false optimism or you can do it sort of sentimentality. Uh, I'm talking about scriptural self-talk. Uh, I'm talking about reminding ourselves of the truths of the Bible because it's amazing what we say to ourselves. Each day we have conversations going on in our heads where we talk to ourselves and we say things and, and sometimes we're aware of it, uh, most of the time we're not. But sometimes the things that we say to ourselves about ourselves are just simply not true. And when we, when we know this is happening, we need to correct ourselves. You know, when we say to ourselves, I don't think God loves me, then we can tell ourselves, I know God loves me. He's shown it by sending Jesus to die for me. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Or when we say to ourselves, God has it in for me. God's against me. We can say to ourselves, this truth, that God is working for my good in everything that happens, even when it's hard. Romans 8, verse 28. Or when we say to ourselves, my life sucks and it's never going to get any better. We can remind ourselves, this is temporary. Jesus will return. Jesus, uh, God will restore me and life will be better than I could ever imagine. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 to 4. See, we need God's promises and we need to know them like the back of our hands. We need to remind ourselves of them. We need to speak them to ourselves so that we would endure when the days of suffering come. Well, there you have it. We finally reached the end of the book of Job. Now, Job's story, I think, is a helpful story because it helps us to see that we can have faith even when it hurts. That we can keep going even when we're in pain, and that even in our suffering, we can entrust ourselves to God. I want to finish with these words about Job from the New Testament letter of James. Uh, James chapter 5, verse 10, which says this. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed 
those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Yeah, we've heard of Job's endurance over these last nine weeks, and today we have seen the outcome from the Lord. And so let's remember. Remember Job's endurance, remember God's promises, and let's endure until the end. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book of the Bible. We thank you for giving us Job as an example of endurance. Father, please help us to remember your precious promises. Please strengthen us to have faith when it hurts. And we ask this so that we might endure until the end. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.